Hello and welcome. He not only advised a number of US presidents, he even ran for office himself and is considered one of the remaining champions of original conservative politics in Washington, D.C. This week on 101, meet writer, commentator and broadcaster Pat Buchanan. He has managed to maneuver the complicated web of Washington, D.C.'s political world for nearly half a century, initially making a name for himself as a journalist, before diving into the world of politics by joining the presidential campaign of Richard Nixon in 1966 and surviving the Watergate scandal of the early 1970s. For a while after, Pat Buchanan returned to the media as a broadcaster and political commentator, gaining a high profile, although often courting controversy. After advising President Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, talk began about him bidding for the country's highest office. And by the early 1990s, Pat Buchanan was considered a relatively serious conservative contender. And for nearly a decade, he was a key figure in the Republican Party. Disillusioned by 1999, Buchanan sought the nomination of the Reform Party, finishing fourth in the 2000 election. The top job may have eluded him so far, but few rule out the voice that Pat Buchanan still has in US politics. Pat Buchanan, great to have some time with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rizzo. Well, sir, you know, both the fields in which you've served uh, extensively, politics and journalism, have really changed, I think, quite a lot over the years that, you know, you've been there since you first got into them. How do you regard the way they've developed? And I, and I guess especially the world of conservative politics uh, with, with the, you know, the development of the neocons and so on. Well, the neoconservatives basically, they came aboard back in early 1980. And there were a few of them in the, White, in the administration when I was in the White House, and I worked very well with them. But the real breach came with them in the late 80s and, and early 1990s when they began to push after the Cold War for a new interventionist foreign policy to change the world, to democratize mankind. And this had nothing to do with traditional conservatism as I stood it, we, uh, I understood it. We came out of the Robert Taft wing, the Barry Goldwater wing of the party, and we were not crusaders. Uh, we believed that we had to fight the Cold War and resist communism and contain it until it collapsed. And when it did, we said, our war is over, come home America. And that's when they headed out to crusade in the world. To what degree has politics become a case of politicking now, professional politicking, as opposed to really serving the public? Well, I think the part, uh, politics has become nastier than it was overall. Uh, there's left c less camaraderie. There's less a sense of comedy in it. Uh, and it is brutal. Uh, we not only go out to defeat our opponents now, we go out to uh, uh, destroy them and, uh, and put them in prison. And journalism itself also, another area where you've made a mark, it's, it's also not what it used to be, is it? No, it's not. I came up in journalism. I was a 23-year-old editorial writer at the St. Louis Grove Democrat youngest editorial writer in a major paper in America. We were considered one of the most right-wing, savage newspapers in America. I reread those editorials I wrote about President Kennedy. They're very respectful. <laughs> There's a wiseacre line here and there, but they're very respectful. And now you see the words people are called liars and racist and all these other terms every day. And they become a normal terms of discourse in American politics and journalism, and it's, uh, and it's deplorable. Well, let's take you back. Uh, you, you're one of the few people I could meet in Washington, D.C. You can say you were born in Washington, D.C., which is you know, I was, nowadays. Riz, I was one of nine children born in Washington, D.C., inside the Beltway before there was a Beltway. My father was born and raised in Washington, D.C. None of us was involved in politics. And my first touch of political activity, of course, other than the dinner table, where my father lectured off on what was going on in the world constantly, was I was a caddy at the Burning Tree Country Club one summer, and I used to see General Eisenhower come out there, and one day, guess who walked in when all the other, the black caddies, who were the senior caddies, they were all gone, and there were two of us on the bench, two white kids, Vice President Richard Milhouse Nixon. And so we went around in his uh, twosome, went around with him in his twosome, and in 1965, I would meet him, and to impress him, I described his golf bag and the senior pro and the junior pro at the club, which is how I got hired. I'll get onto that in just a few moments. Now, 
Tell me about that uh, time before, you know, as a child growing up in, in what would have been a very different Washington, D.C.? Well, Washington, D.C., well, during the war, the military was all over here, but I was very, very young then. You'd see soldiers walking all over. We were part of a Catholic ghetto, if you will. 10% of the city was Catholic, and we went to our own Catholic parochial schools, our own Jesuit high schools, we're Christian brothers, our own Catholic colleges and universities. And it was a wonderful town. It was a great ground town to grow up in. It was a soft southern town, what Jack Kennedy said, it's got, uh, it's got northern charm and southern efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> Still a segregated town, though. It was a completely segregated town, but it, this was not like Birmingham or some of those places in the south. It was not a violent town. It was a, it, I mean, quite frankly, it was, if you call it segregation, and it was completely segregated, it was a much softer form of segregation than you knew down south. But it came off very easily and very well here. I was fascinated to read that you can trace your family roots back to the 1600s. It's absolutely amazing. Well, the Buchanans went from uh, Scotland all the way over to the, plant, over to the plantation in Northern Ireland, and then they left there. As I said, they arrived in North Carolina, the Buchanans did around, I would say around 1820, 1790 to 1820, and as we said, they went straight there to Mississippi, and they immediately began to agitate for secession. Your father was, uh, in terms of the, the, you know, the history, your father was very proud of the, the roots, I think. And you were saying that he actually sat at the dinner table and, and kept you up to date on world affairs as well. Well, he, he was amazing. Uh, he was an amazing man. He had nine children, but he read the columnists in all the newspapers and the newspapers closely. He was very anti getting into World War I. His uncle Charlie had been in there. And he was very anti, he had been pro-FDR. He was a, you know, a Catholic kid and also from the South, so completely democratic. In Roosevelt's first term and midway through the second term until the famous packing of the Supreme Court. And he turned very much against him. And he very much felt that Franklin Roosevelt was deliberately pushing to get us into war, World War II, in order to pull the British chestnuts out of the fire as the old isolationist used to say. And, you know, I went back and studied all that history to write a, a large volume on that, and I figured he was pretty much right. <laughs> what about your mother, Catherine? Uh, what sort of influence did she have on the household? She was a nurse and a homemaker, really, wasn't she? She, was, she came down during the Depression, 17 years old, became a nurse at Providence Hospital, where she, uh, all nine of her children were delivered at the old Providence Hospital in the inner city. Uh, and she was quite a woman, and she would go down, even when she was married, they would come out to the house and ask her if she would go down. The black women were having their babies in their homes, and if they would, she could go in and be a midwife there, and the black man, my father would tell me, would guard the end of the alley and everything. Yeah, and she, uh, I mean, she was a homemaker and a mother her entire life for that until we were all gone, and then she got into all these Catholic charitable activities. She, did, did she have the same kind of strong opinions as your father? Did that come solely from him, or was she the same as well? Well, I think when she grew up, her father was a railroadman laid off during the Depression. I don't know if he ever got work again. He came out of the Mon Valley of west, uh, west southwestern Pennsylvania. He was very depressed. After the war, it just died. And uh, that's where he and his sons were from, and uh, his four youngest sons all served in uh, World War II. So you got your master's degree in journalism from Columbia University in 1962 and, and gone straight into this job at 23, as you'd mentioned, the youngest editorial writer at the uh, St. Louis uh, Globe Democrat. Um, it must have been quite an exciting time having so much responsibility at an early age like that, straight in the deep end. Well, really did. Well, I initially went out there. The first week I started writing obituaries, and then they had me doing reporting for the rest of that week. And then somebody left on the business page and because I had an economic writing fellowship at Columbia and I had done accounting for a year, they put me over into the business page and all of a sudden, six weeks after I was there, there was an opening on the editorial page. So I said, why not? I went back to the editorial editor and I said, I'd like to apply for the opening. And he said, we desperately need someone. They only had two editorial writers. And he said, you can fill in until we hire the new man. So once I got in there, I was, they were not going to get me out of there. <laughs> I was fairly ambitious, Riz. <laughs> you got to advise a number of U.S. presidents, got close to them, and, and I want to start with Richard Nixon because, of course, you know, you went through a very interesting time with him. Of course, there was the Watergate scandal that took place in the early 70s, too, and uh, there was actually some speculation you might have been deep throat, the, the informant right. behind everything in, in Watergate. Um, tell me about that relationship you had with Nixon. Well, my relationship with Richard Nixon was extremely close. I came with him at the end of 1965 after I had a meeting with him 
after we'd met out there in Belleville, Illinois. And he hired me on the spot, and I joined up around January of 66, and I stayed with him for eight and a half years until the helicopter lifted off the pad at the White House after his resignation. And the first, in the first two years, I was his basically his only staff member. I was right outside his office. I would speak with him three, four, five hours a day. He was an extraordinarily interesting man. He would call you in and question you about issues, put out his position, ask you yours, argue it, and you would go through hour after hour. He, he, was an extra, he had an extraordinary mind, constantly interested in information, and he did tell me, he said, Pat, once he said, you know, if I had to practice law the rest of my life, I'd be intellectually dead in two years and physically in four. Well, 1974, when, when Nixon did leave, Gerald Ford took over. You were, you were there for a little while uh, with him. I was there uh, for as long, until it took them to get me out of there. <laughs> what happened was I was there, and I was helping President Ford on, on press conferences and other things, and I was under Al Haig, and Al Haig asked me to stay on. And I said, I want to go, Al. And he said, stay on for a while. Uh, we're going to teach these folks some things. And so we stayed on. And what happened was, however, when, when Ford pardoned Nixon, Ford pardoned Nixon, I was in Canada, and Al Haig had put through Buchanan for ambassador to South Africa, and Gerald Ford had signed it. And so the pardon exploded everything. And then Evans and Novak had a column saying this bloody nose gut fighter from the Nixon era is going to be ambassador to South Africa, State Department and everything. So Rumsfeld came in and in a very short order I was gone. Well I know that, that gave Thankfully. you an, well, <laughs> and I know that gave you the opportunity to go back into journalism. You you got involved with three shows, founding three shows actually, the McLaughlin Group, Capital Gang and Crossfire. I was I was the founding one of the founding fathers of three of the most famous <laughs> controversial shows. <laughs> Of, of American journalism. And I think they had a great effect on politics. Maybe not beneficial, but Crossfire, we started that in 19, the spring of 19, uh, 1982. We started the McLaughlin Group in the spring of 1982. And then we started Capital Gang in the mid-1980s over at CNN, right. What made you go back uh, in 1985 then into politics with uh, becoming director of communications for Ronald Reagan? Well, I loved Ronald Reagan. I, all, I thought he was a great, fine man. I had supported him in 1976. My sister had worked for him. I had supported him in 1980. Uh, I thought he was a, a good man and could become a great president. And I got a phone call from Don Regan, who said, I'd like you to be communications director. He had come in as chief of staff in Ronald Reagan's second term, and when he's shifting, and I didn't hesitate. I was in there, and we were in the West Wing, and office, as I said, I was equidistant between Vice President George H. W. Bush and President Bush <laughs> in a windowless office in the inner sanctum of the White House. But it was a wonderful experience with uh, Ronald Reagan. He was a wonderful man. Uh, and you don't realize it until he's gone. But I was with him at uh, the Geneva summit with Gorbachev. And I was with him over there when that Reykjavik summit occurred and the whole thing blew up. I saw him coming out of that room with, uh, with Gorbachev. I've never seen Reagan like that. His face was a mask of rage and anger, and we went to the embassy, and uh, we got to the embassy, and he was using language that Ronald Reagan didn't use, usually use. Then we went out to that Kefalovic Air Base, which is about an hour away, where we we're going to fly home on Air Force One very late at night. And I I've re had to rewrite the speech. I'd written his speech on a successful summit, and I had to write it on cards and print it out <laughs> in, the, in my limo going out there. And there's a picture on the wall of... Reagan looking at these cards, what's this all about? And I said, this is the insert we got to say about the summit. And then he went out, and you know those Air Force personnel had been waiting there, their wives and their kids, for six hours for the President of the United States, and he walked out, and that place exploded. I mean, it brought tears to your eyes. I mean, it was, like a Hollywood, it was like a Hollywood movie. And so he got up there, and of course, he was the old Ronald Reagan again, telling stories. And, uh, and, and then we flew all the way home, you know, and after that summit blew up, we flew all the way home. Frankly, I was delighted because I thought the deal was terrible. But, uh, and, and Reagan blew it up. But we, we came back, and I was sitting on the plane with a friend, and we were having some drinks. He came back in his running suit, 
hey, Pat, did I tell you about the time Jimmy Stewart and I? <laughs> <laughs> I said, mm -hmm. this is astonishing. Here's the President of the United States who's blown up one of the most important summits in history. He was enraged by it an hour and a half ago, and now he's back here telling stories. That was Ronald Reagan. I understand you also had a cat named Gipper who used to sit on your lap and get all the inside information during the staff meeting. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't take him down to the staff meetings. We got, I bought a cat in 1985, and I would come home. I kept saying, we got to give him a name. we got to think of a name for him. It was about three months before we thought of a name. I came home one night, and I think they were calling him the Gipper. I said, okay, we'll just call him Gipper. And eventually his name was Gipper B, and, uh, and because we had, had to give him an initial for the last name. Well, I know that you, uh, your sister, as you'd mentioned, worked with uh, Ronald Reagan as a uh, U.S. Treasurer under him. And I think it was around 1986 that she started this kind of Buchanan for President movement. Well, you, were, you were a bit wary of that at first, weren't you? Well, we had a meeting over here. Basically, uh, after I was, uh, when Ronald Reagan got caught in the Iran-Contra scandal, um, I had gone out and, uh, and I had defended Ronald Reagan and, uh, on television in a, in a great rally down there in Cuba before 5,000 Cubans. And people were talking then, because we're just going into 1987, about the presidential election, which was open, and George H.W. Bush was the favorite. And a lot of people were pushing me to get into the race, including my sister and many others. And we had a big meeting right over here, filled these rooms over here. And I thought of it, and I considered it, and Jack Kemp was in it, and we would have divided the conservative vote, and was there a chance? And so I, I backed out of it, you know. And uh, my father didn't live to see me run for president, and I think he had wanted me to run. So it was something of a disappointment, but I think basically it was the right decision in 1988. Four years later, you, you did decide to go for the Republican Party nomination against uh, George H.W. Bush. Um, the, again, something obviously triggered your mind to think it was time to, to try it. Well, it, the problem was George H.W. Bush and I were very good friends. And I, I still like George H.W. Bush. I don't think the Bush family is very fond of me. But my feeling was, and I think, I think President Reagan wondered what President Bush was doing with the New World Order after the Cold War, uh, with raising taxes, with the new regulations, and then with imposing a quota bill on small businesses. That was sort of the final straw for me. And I said, look, if nobody else is going to make the case that this is not a conservative administration, then I'm going to go to New Hampshire and I will do it myself. And my sister was very much behind it. My wife was very much behind it. And fortunately, the Manchester Union leader was very much behind it. Well, of course, you also tried again in 96 uh, against uh, Dole. We did a lot. Well, we did very we did well in 92. Yeah. I was within 15 points of the President of the United States, which was, uh, I think, quite an achievement. It was one of the strongest runs against, uh, uh, against the sitting president in history. And I think the Bush family believes that we damaged him badly and uh, cost him the election, maybe, along with Ross Perot. But 92, uh, 92 was, uh, or excuse me, 96 was much more successful. Uh, we started off and uh, I won the Alaska caucuses. We were looking to Arizona as the decisive primary. And when I lost it, I knew we weren't going to win the nomination, and that was it for Pat Buchanan's presidential dreams. Well, what was it that made you disillusioned with the Republican Party in 1999 and say, right, I'm, I'm moving on? I think the, all during the, during the decade, I saw first the Cold War. The Cold War was over. And the United States, while well, the Soviet Union had collapsed and torn itself to pieces over that, they had enormous exertions, and we were a stronger country. But we were also weakened by the Cold War. We also invested enormous amounts of money in weaponry and wars and defending countries all over the world. And I also saw in California the, the illegal immigrants pouring into California. And then I saw the American factories were leaving the country. I'd been a strong free trader. I mean, I was a traditional conservative, a Milton Friedman free trader. And I said, look, the, this free trade policy is deindustrializing America. It's taking away the best jobs of working men and women, the jobs that high school graduates get to the point where they're making enough when they're in mid 20s to buy a home, get married, and have kids. We're destroying the country I grew up in. The idea of free trade is excellent as an abstract idea. It's excellent inside the United States, but you can't compete. American workers can't be made to compete with people in Singapore, Malaysia, who are making $2 an hour, or in Mexico, $2 an hour. So uh, it seemed to me that the 
Republican Party was frozen in the past. It was frozen in a past to which I belonged in the 1960s because I believed all these things. And I was also a coal warrior, but the Cold War was over. And there were new crises and new problems confronting the country, and it seemed to me the Republican Party was not addressing them. Uh, the, clearly, my campaign uh, for the Reform Party nomination <laughs> was successful in terms of getting that nomination, and it was very bloody, but we got the party on all 50 states. Uh, but then we just took a fearful battering, and by getting it on the, all 50 states, I'd fallen out of the news, and where I started in the teens, in terms of numbers, I was down to next to nothing at the end. In 2000, you ran uh, for president again on the Reform Party ticket. That's right. And did very well. You came fourth in the overall race, I gather. Well, but it still wasn't as good as I'd hoped or as good as I expected. And uh, uh, we did a good job getting the party on all 50 state ballots. We did a good job in winning the nomination. But we broke with Perot, and it was a bloodbath out there in Long Beach. And, it was, and I had a surgery right during the middle of the campaign. And that took out half the campaign time recuperating. And, uh, and so it ended up that we only got, uh, we only got, we got less than 1% of the vote. Well, Nader, I think, got 2% or more. Uh, but we did do very well in Palm Beach County, as um, Al Gore will tell you. Then back at, well, then back at, uh, back at the Republican Party again by 2004. Well, I endorsed George Bush for a second term uh, because I said, uh, with um, Kerry, we get nothing. With Gore, we'll get maybe good, with Bush, we'll get good judges, you know, we'll get, uh, We'll get other things that we really want, uh, tax cuts, good judges. But with, Gore, with, uh, with John Kerry, we get nothing that we want. So we've got, those are the only two choices in that event. I'm for George Bush's reelection. And then he was reelected, and he, he got up in his inaugural and said, we're going to end tyranny in our world. I said, for a conservative, that sounds mildly utopian. <laughs> we're going to go all over the world and end tyranny in the world? And then you said no more uh, runs for president for you. That's a, that's a final, is it? I think the American people have said that. <laughs> <laughs> you never know with politics, though, is it? Well, you know, the, the, as we say, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. <laughs> if you could do it all again, what would you do differently? Well, you know, it's, uh, that's a very, it's a very good question. You know, I've... You know, you made the decisions that you thought were right at the time, uh, based on the information. I don't know if I would have run for the third party thing in year 2000. I should have looked down the road further and, and seen what would happen, and I failed. And uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, it's hard for me to think of it. I mean, look, I've had a very good life. I've had a very good life. That's the best way, no regrets. <laughs> well, it is. You know, obviously got some regrets, but it's, uh, we've been blessed, you know. We've, uh, what was it the Abbe de Say said during the, uh, after the, uh, after the French Revolution, they asked him what he did during the Revolution. He said, I survived. <laughs> <laughs> I keep that to... How would you like to be remembered? If you could have a legacy that, that would be there set for you, what would it be? Well, you know, I, you know with your friends and, and your family, you, you hope you've, you hope you you've lived a life of honor and you've done uh, and you've done things right and that they see that that you've done things right but you know I think what's happened to my country in my lifetime I you know I came out after World War II we we're on top of the world during the Eisenhower Kennedy era I mean this was an astonishing country we could do anything we're going to the moon that was it and a lot of that is gone that spirit is gone we're fighting with each other. I think the country, in a way, as a country, is disintegrating. And I think it's because we've lost our faith. I think we've, and the faith, of course, is the source of culture. The culture is disintegrating. Uh, it's not as good a country, I think, as it was uh, in a lot of ways. And I think it may not be as great a country as it was. And a lot of this is our own fault. And how would it, you know, in terms of how people would remember you then, what would it be? Uh, what was it? They, they have, uh, it's the, um, it's in Tombstone, Arizona. Have you ever been out there? I mean, so they have the Battle of the OK Corral. There's a tombstone that says simply up there, here lies Jake Smith. He done his damnedest. <laughs>
Well, I wish you luck. Pat Buchanan, thank you so much for your time, sir. Well, thanks for coming out to McLean, Rizzo. Thank you. <laughs>